Okay, here we are. We are now in chapter nine. We are continuing with our uh, lesson on the cognitive or on the development of ages, um, I guess, three through six. So we're looking at that early childhood um, span of life. And so chapter eight talked about the biological development at that time. And now we're in chapter nine that will talk about the cognitive or how children at this age, how they learn. So we're gonna jump right into the PowerPoint that you see here. Get this moving and, and operating and flowing for you and then we'll go right into, and I'll explain as necessary. Again, I'm going to drop the entire PowerPoint into week three so that you're able to look at it and review it at your, at your, your leisure. I'm just going to talk through and kind of give you some talking points that will assist you in your looking and your reading. So executive function at this age, they are able to organize and prioritize their thoughts. They're able to um, plan behavior. They're able to carry out some, uh, some ideas and some strategies and plans. Um, and it is based off of what they have learned. So what they have learned, what they have seen, um, what they are figuring out uh, with their own little thinking, they're able to do a little bit more and think a little bit more um, independently. They're able to rational, rationalize some information at that young age, at that tender age, um, to carry out those decisions. So uh, again, I think I mentioned it in chapter eight, uh, when we talked about the, um, the difficulty with with foster care, that that age of seven is when that character of the individual has been a foundation is there and that many um, parents or many individuals, many families do not want to adopt uh, a child that has been in foster care beyond the age of seven because of the, the framework that has been laid. So that led into a perfect segue to understand or to uh, reiterate or to emphasize that ages two through six is a very sensitive time in development. This is where they are open to learning. They are open to suggestion. They have a lot to learn because by the age of seven, that foundation, that floor has been, has been laid. And so this is a level of high functioning, a level of high um, rationalizing, a level of high uh, teaching that is able to be done at this era. Matter of fact, as an educator, we find that what a child has not learned um, in those pre-K and, and kindergarten stages, that those deficits it carries on all the way through and you will find that children with deficits in this area if it's not um, taken care of properly as they're matriculating on then this also is an indication or an indicator of putting children in special education because the deficits are too large for an educator at that um, stage or that grade level to accommodate and fix. And so unfortunately, the answer has been or was to put the child in a special education setting where things are taught at a much lower, uh, slower level. And of course, all those things are changed because it's not that's not how you use special education, but that's how it has been used in education. And so this is the pre-operational intelligence. When we talk about our theorist Piaget, I'm not going to go through this. Um, I just want to kind of highlight a few things like language and imagination. This is where you have the, the play time and they're learning the rules of the playground and they're learning how to interact with other individuals, interact with other children, um, the imagination, the the play friends and, and playing with different um, dolls and, and toys and trucks and things of you know of, of that sort this is where all of this has taken place and again um I, i'll leave this for your your reading as you go through um 
this is where the the high interest in animation um, is very uh, is very lively at this age. This is where uh, they're able to um, identify with with. Uh, with cartoon identify with talking animals um, where it expresses um, that everything comes alive and so uh, this is the age where you are able to maximize as far as an animation artist where this will really captivate the attention of this child if you were to show this type of um, cartoon here as we see here to a, a 12 year old um, they're probably not interested <laughs> So the idea of everything comes alive and the fantasy and the, the wow factor of that is, is geared for children at this age because it, it, it's, um, it's accepted and, and it's welcomed um, at this age. And it's not seen as irrational or, um, or, or nonsense. <laughs> and they accept it as this could really happen and, and, and they, they enjoy it. So some differences in pre-operational thought, you have static reason and you have a uh, irreverse, irreversibility, <laughs> a tongue twister for you there. Um, and then you have the definitions um, here. Uh, static reasoning is that the young child will think that nothing changes. Again, this um, feeds into the sensitivity um, of children at this age at what they see according to their their level of reasoning it's supposed to stay um, if you look at this at the dynamics of families if you find that um, adults that have had uh, some some issues um, uh, maybe depression or other type of malfunctions as an adult if you talk with them and spend time with with them in conversation and just in therapy you will find that the uh, the the, the trigger or the, the, the stamp, the lifespan stamp was in this, this age, around six or seven, something dramatic happened and it just stamped um, their, their life forever and you saw it continue to progressively grow and now they're as an adult and now there's a full blown problem. So if you ever um, have a chance to even talk, it usually is stamped at this age of, of lifespan development. And then irre irreversibility um, is where uh, the child thinks that nothing can, can be undone, um, that it can't be restored. So it shouldn't change. And if it changes, it can't change back. So it's a kind of a, a permanent, a, a permanent um, way of thinking, a pre-operation is, is concrete, it's forming some concrete values about what should happen and what should happen next. And I, I'll leave this one again for you all to, uh, to go through. Um, from introduction to psychology, if you remember, I'm not sure what professor you had, but I'm sure you had a, a, an awesome one where it talked about um, the idea that I can have uh, the same amount of something, but if I if I have five quarters in, in two rows and if I stretch out the quarters on row two, that child would think that row two has more quarters because if it has the same amount, they should be the same length. And so since one length is, is larger or longer rather, then that must mean that it has more quarters in that row. And so that whole idea of, of concrete and, and this is not how it's supposed to be and con you know the idea of conservation, this is um, seen displayed in the behavior of children at this age. And of course, as they grow older, that tends to fade and they understand that no, something changed and it's okay. But at this age, they have some very concrete ideas of what it should look like and their logic of how it should be and anything that deviates from that is not well received or understood. And so when we move from the social aspect 
of um, of of PSJ. Now we go to Vyskoski and we look at the social learning. This is how um, they learn how to function and operate in the setting and in the world that they are being placed in. What is uh, the way of behaving in at home and what is the way of behaving at school and what is the way of behaving with their peers. They're learning all of this um, also at this time. And so they become sort of like an apprentice and thinking and they're looking at other individuals they're, they're looking at you know parents they're looking at cousins they're looking at family members they're looking at friends they're looking at teachers they're looking at all over to try and figure out how am i supposed to behave what are the social norms in each context that i'm in and it takes time and so you may find that how they behave at home um, may, be the, may be the same way that they behave at school. And so teachers are now having to teach the students, well, what you do at home, dear, you can't do here at school. And so all those different um, social norms are being taught uh, at this age. And it's either done by encouraging the behavior to continue or discouraging the behavior um, to shift. And I will leave this for you to, to take care of. I've kind of gone over a little bit of that um, with you. Um, language um, as a tool, uh, this goes into the, the, the rearing, what you say um, to children in the home environment, what you say to children in the school environment, language advances thinking. And so we are taught, um, especially as an educator, to use positive um, speech in how you address um, children to make sure that their self-esteem is, is held intact as you are correcting and, and redirecting uh, behavior curriculum that is high in, in content as with the STEM curricula. All of these things are, are taught um, that will further um, develop the brain and the comprehension. And so you will find that sometimes um, the, uh, the level, the expectations of different schools across different districts, you see that there's a difference. Um, it should not be that way, but unfortunately there is. And so you will find some parents that will put their children in private schools, some parents that will put their children in charter schools, some parents that will put their children in, um, in strict academic settings where there's a certain type of curriculum that is being set because you are grooming um, or you are directing and driving the, uh, the brain power, you are the, the academic outcome of that child. So you will put them in an environment that is conducive to that type of language and expectations that are being spoken so that the child can live up to and measure up to those standards. And I'll continue here and you can read more about STEM learning at your own time. Um, this is pretty much uh, self-explanatory theory, theory. Uh, they explain everything they see in here. Um, so children are not, are not tattling <laughs> about what's happening in the household. They're just explaining to someone that wants to listen to what they saw <laughs> or what they have heard their parents say or do. And so it's not as if they are intentionally in, in a way to, uh, to, to air out the family's business. They're just in a mindset of this is what I saw and let me tell you what I saw and teacher, this is what happened. And so sometimes teachers, many times, all the time, teachers at this very tender age, they receive a lot of information about what happens at the house because that's what a child will do at this tender age. They are explaining everything. So if they see a whole lot, <laughs> then they're going to talk a whole lot about what they are seeing and what they have heard. So as parents, we learn to be um, mindful of that fact. And here's the, the psychological reason why. They're developing, <laughs> they're developing their brain, they're developing social norms. And so they don't know what happened. They don't know why this is happening. So let me just tell you what I saw so you can help me make sense of it. <laughs> so they're seeking help. They're not seeking to, um, to really air out uh, the family affairs uh, in the household. Um, theory of mind, um, you see where they're trying to, um, 
rationalize uh, consequences and behavior. And this is the age where you will uh, see children um, begin to lie. They begin to tell lies because they understand that at this age, that if I tell them what I have done, there are some consequences. And so they will begin to rationalize, how can I get out of this situation? They will, at this age, tell you whatever it is that sounds logical to them. But of course, as as parents and adults, we're like, that is so not true. <laughs> but for their, their way of developing, it makes sense. It just makes perfect sense. But this is the age when children begin to lie. And so what, what strengthens um, that ability, what strengthens the theory of mind, um, it goes back to what they are seeing, what they are hearing, um, the context of it, what they're viewing on television that will um, support, um, uh, increase their ability of doing so. Uh, just a, a short caveat, um, I was watching a show with my daughter and it's called um, Big Fat Liar. And uh, and the it's the the whole story is about this child has obviously um, lied <laughs> lied all of all of their child so now they're in high school and they have become very very um, very sophisticated in their lying to the point where they have uh, calls that are being diverted to their own cell phone so if the teacher calls uh, the dad then then there's a voice decoder where when they answer the phone, um, it's in the voice of their father, but it's saying what they, you know, what they would, would say. And I mean, it's just a sophisticated system of lying <laughs> until one day um, when they were, they told the truth, um, it didn't work out for them. So if you have a chance to look at the movie, just maybe a clipping of it, uh, Big Fat Liar, but it was really um, interesting to see that they, the child was kind of duped by an adult liar and, and, and how uh, he he tried to justify and, and win justice for himself by actually having to tell the truth and figure out some things on his own because no one believed in what he was saying. So again, um, there was a lot of... Uh, lot of things that were there in place for that child to develop such a sophisticated way of lying. And then this goes into um, what I was kind of uh, alluding to before with this chart of could uh, an obedient, honest three-year-old become a disobedient and lying five-year-old. And so um, we see how, how things can, can progress that maybe at the tender age of three, you know, maybe some things have happened. Maybe they are starting to explore some things a little bit differently and, and they're they're curious and perhaps they're getting into a little bit of trouble and where they would have told on themselves at three, um, they are now lying about it at five. And so just know that it is a, a, a progressive, based on experience, they're not just um, lying. Uh, it, it's just, it's progressive, it's progressive. And I'll leave this um, to you as far as uh, language development and mastering vocabulary and the amount of words. So I do want to pause and I want to ask a question here. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts of an average child knowing 500 words at the age of two and 10,000 at the age of six? D describe, give me your thoughts. Give me your thoughts about this. What, what are your thoughts about it? What do you think factors into the um, the high uh, volume of, of word attainment and, and, and uh, how does this happen? So I'll be interested to hear your thoughts um, about that third bullet here, that the average child knows about 500 words at the age of two and more than 10,000 at the age of six. Remember, what they know may not always be articulated out because they are processing that too. We learned that from the earlier chapters, but give me your thoughts about that statement. Again, vocabulary explosion and then fast mapping. Again, things are moving quite rapidly and they're putting things together. They're learning subject and verbs and adjectives and adverbs and conjunctions and many nouns are being introduced and mastered. So there's a very high um, rate of, of vocabulary introduction and assimilation. 
acquiring grammar. Um, again, a lot of this is taught. Uh, they're taught to speak in complete sentences, to write in complete sentences, the rules, the syntax. Um, all of this is being taught uh, at this time and expected for them to use. And now there's also testing that happens at these age, um, these uh, kind of mastery concept testing that happens. Um, I can't remember um, the name of the test that's given at this age um, to children to master the fluency of their reading, the fluency of their writing, the fluency of their speaking, but tests are given at this age. And then information about um, dual or bilingual children. So I'm gonna kind of skip through some of this. Um, again, some factors that play into that vocabulary um, explosion, book reading, parent education, language enhancement, and then preschool programs. We know that children that go to preschool um, and they fare to do better than children that start school at the age of kindergarten because a lot of things are taught at that preschool level. And so um, we know through experience, perhaps uh, research for sure that there is a difference. Um, early childhood education, again, kind of alluding to that um, as a segue into this slide here, uh, teacher child interaction correlates with learning. And so you wanna make sure that every child participates in, in what is being taught this is the, uh, the importance as an educator of having children participate in class. The more that they are talking and interacting with the teacher, the more that they are learning. So a quiet child is not always learning the most because there's no way to identify what is being, um, what is being absorbed and comprehended. So interaction is very, very important in a, child, um, in a child's life in the classroom setting. And so as, a, as an educator, I speak from an educator to kind of give you that insight. I know most of you are in medicine, you're going into nursing, but some of you are our parents. And so I just want to kind of give you the inside, the inside scoop on what is happening and why it happens and why this is so important in the development of children. So the child-centered and developmental programs that are being implemented into the classroom now of teachers being less of just disseminating information and putting them in groups where it shifts to their own interaction, to their learning on their own, the teacher just facilitating the learning. Here's the reason why, because we know that um, interacting with others um, through conversation, through a lax type of, um, type of, of environment, they learn more than just following adult directions because you can follow instructions and not really understand anything. You're just kind of learning what to do. And, you know, I've, I've even had, um, as an educator in the early part of my career, where I would give assignments to my students to read. And the students, by watching others, they knew how to look like they were reading. They were not on any gadgets or any cell phones. Um, they were paying attention, but they knew how to look like a student that was reading the textbook and they were not. And they even had it down to a science that when they saw someone else flip a page, then they would flip a page too. So they weren't reading, they were just modeling the appropriate behavior to show what I wanted to see until I started doing some read aloud and now they couldn't just kind of fake it. They actually had to do something. And even with the reading, they knew how to read um, the information, but there was no comprehension. So now I had to add some dialogue. I had to add some discussions. I had to add some turn to your partner and talk this out because they would read fluent readers, but no level of, of real um, meaningful comprehension. It was just, uh, just memorization. And then these are the different types of child-centered um, programs. You have Montessori, um, which is very, uh, a little bit more popular than the other two that are listed here. We hear a lot about Montessori and Montessori is just where they're kind of working at their own pace and they move, the, the curriculum is fluid. 
So although they may be at the age of seven, they may be working in the first or second grade level because the curriculum is just fluid enough for them to move um, move through it. And the other ones, as you can see here, they're not really um, a part of the, the curriculum um, programs or child center programs here in, uh, in the States. <clears throat> and then again, I talked to you about teacher directed. Uh, it's more of the teacher teaching to the class. And as an educator, we are being taught and trained to move away from that type of uh, education um, dissemination of information deployment and more of where the children are working together and you just kind of move around and, and see what's going on. It's very um, cost, it, it's, it's cheaper <laughs> to be teacher directed because the children are just listening. We call it an education sit and get. So they're just sitting and expected to get all this information. Whereas if you move to something that is more uh, student centered, then now there have to be manipulatives. There have to be some uh, materials that are being uh, given and passed out to the students where they're able to touch and feel and and handle on their own. And so it, it costs um, the educational system more to be more um, student centered and less teacher centered. And again, the information about Head Start and Pre-K and why those programs um, were there, but initially uh, it was quite expensive to um, to maintain. And so they did begin to fade out, unfortunately, um, but we do see that it, it should, should have stayed. But now they have moved Head Start more into the um, daycares. So daycares have become the new Head Start because now daycares are expected to teach all of this information that Head Start was teaching before and now where Head Start was governmentally funded, um, daycare is funded by the consumers. So if you want the education, if you want the Head Start, then you're going to have to pay for it yourself. <laughs> and just some more information about the effectiveness of these type of programs. So that concludes um, this presentation or lecture notes on chapter nine. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns other than the question that I posted, you know what to do. Just leave it in the thread below and just tag it as chapter nine and your question there, and then we'll interact that way. So until next time, I will see you. This is your instructor, Dr. King.